Isn't engineering brilliant? Working in teams, problem solving, design, calculations. Seeing your ideas become real things, brilliant. Get everything right and you'll be responsible for a great product. And every great product has lessons in how to be brilliant. I'm Rob Bell and this is the Institution of Mechanical Engineers Top 5 Aircraft here at the Royal Air Force Museum, London. Let's head into the museum to discover five great planes and five lessons in engineering excellence. During the First World War, this was state of the art in aircraft design. It had thin wings, which gave lift without too much drag. But these thin wings were weak, and so you needed this cat's cradle of wires to brace them. And these wires caused lots of drag. In engineering, you need to think at the system level. So for this example, what is the drag of the whole wing system? not just the aerofoil. The designers of our number five aircraft considered the problem at that system level. And their solution was a strong, thick wing that didn't need any wires. Our aircraft number five is the Fokker D7. When it was introduced in 1918, this German fighter aircraft was a revelation. Not only did the low drag give good performance, but by a happy accident, the thick wing also had excellent flying characteristics, giving good lift, even at high angles of attack. The result was a very maneuverable fighter. The D7 was also unusual in having a fuselage made of steel tubes rather than wood. Both wing and fuselage were quickly copied after the war by the Allied powers. And because imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, we've made the Fokker D7 number five in our list. Supermarine had never designed a fighter before. Hawker aircraft had been building them for years, yet the Spitfire was better than the Hurricane. North American had never designed a fighter before. Curtis Wright had been building them for years. Yet the Mustang was better than the Kitty Hawk. All of which goes to show that the talent of the team is more important than the experience of the company. Our number four choice is the centerpiece of the museum's new Bomber Command exhibition and was the first heavy bomber designed by Avro, the Lancaster. One of the finest bombers of the Second World War, the Lancaster was designed by a team led by Roy Chadwick. It was a development of their medium bomber, the twin engine Manchester. The Manchester's well known for suffering engine problems, but the rest of the aircraft wasn't trouble free either. The team of engineers quickly learnt from their mistakes and put their hard won lessons into the Lancaster. Lessons that included a wide wingspan for increased lift, larger tails for longitudinal stability, and better hydraulic fittings to help prevent oil leaks. The result was an aircraft with exceptional load carrying capabilities, as well as impressive maneuverability. The Lancaster highlights the power of a well oiled team of engineers that can quickly analyse a failure, find the root cause, and then introduce a new design that solves the problem. And that's why. The Lancaster is our number four aircraft. The 
The arguments about who invented the jet engine and who invented radar still rumble on today. There are no right or wrong answers. And it's quite normal for different engineers from different countries to be working on the same inventions at the same time. After all, great minds think alike. The important question is who first brought out a reliable, usable product and not just a laboratory curiosity? Our choice number three is a helicopter. And not the very first prototype helicopter, but the first to be built in large numbers and used out in the real world. Rescuing downed pilots from mountains and evacuating casualties from the front line. Our number three aircraft is the Sikorsky R4. Igor Sikorsky was born in Kyiv in 1889. Inspired by the sketches of Leonardo da Vinci, he built a rubber band powered toy helicopter when he was just 12. At the age of 20, after studying engineering, Sikorsky built two real helicopters, but quickly realized that the engines at the time weren't powerful enough to make a practical aircraft. So for the next 30 years, he dedicated his work to fixed wing aircraft, first in the Russian Empire and then in the United States. However, he never forgot his childhood dreams and in 1938 returned to helicopter design. The result was the VS-300. It combined a main rotor and a vertical tail rotor driven by the same engine, the layout used by most helicopters ever since. So what's the need for a tail rotor? Well, you may have heard of the theory in physics that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. That's Newton's third law. And the engine on a helicopter that turns the main rotor also wants to turn the body of the helicopter in the opposite direction. So the tail rotor is there to produce a force to counteract that effect. So your helicopter can fly in a straight line and the pilot doesn't get dizzy. The R4 was Igor's first production helicopter. Although it was quickly replaced by larger, more powerful machines, it demonstrated the potential of this new type of aircraft and the different roles it could perform. It is the ancestor of many helicopters in use today. And that's why the Sikorsky R4 is number three in our list. Engineers regularly carry out tests and experiments so they can make fact-based decisions. But do they always remember to write down the learning? Do they always capture the knowledge? Carrying out the experiment is the fun part. Writing the report afterwards, not so much. At worst, the results are forgotten and a few years later, someone has to do the experiment all over again. But at best, engineers don't just hide all the juicy data in a dense report. Instead, they create simple, easy to read charts, allowing other engineers to quickly access the data and make the right design choices. Charts like this one here. Now this shows the vital statistics of an aerofoil in a wind tunnel. And it was created by the American National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, the NACA, which later became the NASA or NASA. Our number two aircraft was designed in a hurry by a team that had never produced a fighter before. And as such, it could have been a flop, but it was arguably the best fighter aircraft of the Second World War. Our number two choice is the North American P-51 Mustang. There was no single reason why the Mustang was such a success, but the fact that its engineers could stand on the shoulders of giants, thumbing through the NACA charts to quickly design these wings, helps us understand why it was right first time and why it had such low drag and such high performance. So remember, to put your results into simple graphs and publish them in reports. Capture that knowledge. 
because that way perhaps you could also design a product as great as our number two choice, the Mustang. The survival of an island nation depends on control of the seas, and that was the vital role of our number one aircraft. Like many great pieces of engineering, it had a long life. It was in service for over 30 years, and it was a dependable workhorse. Our number one aircraft at the RAF Museum London is the Short Sunderland. The Sunderland is a flying boat designed to take off from and land on water. It usually operated from bases on the coast, sometimes landing on the open seas to rescue lost sailors. Sunderlands also landed on river estuaries and lakes. In 1948, they took part in the Berlin Airlift, flying to Lake Havel with vital supplies of coal and salt. But their most important role was hunting U-boats and protecting convoys in the Battle of the Atlantic. Heavily armed and with a long range, the Sunderland was ideal for this role. Here at the museum, you can actually walk through this aircraft. Let's go and have a look. Oh. <laughs> wow, there is so much space in here. It certainly feels a bit more like stepping onto a ship than any kind of usual aircraft. Look at all this. To help detect submarines, the aircraft were fitted with radar. And when they spotted a U-boat, these depth charges would be winched out under the wings on either side and dropped into the sea below. The Sunderland could defend itself too. It bristled with machine guns and was well capable of fighting off enemy aircraft. It would be home to a crew of around 10 on flights of more than 12 hours. They were even served hot meals from the galley. There were bunk beds where the crew could rest when off duty. And there were other facilities that you definitely need on those long flights. Unlike most other aircraft, the Sunderland stayed in service for long after World War II. It still had a role to play. That long and successful career is why we've chosen the Sunderland as our number one aircraft here at the RAF Museum London. We hope you've enjoyed this video and if you don't agree with our choices then let us know in the comments below. We want to hear your top five and the reasons for them. If you can, why not drop in to the RAF museums here in London or in the Midlands at Cosford. If you're interested in finding out more about an exciting career in engineering, then click the link below and perhaps even consider becoming an engineer yourself. The world needs more engineers.